So I need to be honest with you about something this morning, and uh, it might be a little shocking to some of you, uh, a little hard to hear, but here it is. I hate playing board games. Uh, I know, uh, but actually it's worse. I'm going to get a little more specific. Um, I hate playing board games with my wife. Um, I get it. Uh, Yeah, you're laughing. Some of you, it's your thing. Uh, Great date night, fun pastime, uh, maybe lots of great memories with your family and friends around a table playing a game. Not me, though. Uh, And here's why. Because somehow, some way, it seems like every time I get into or I play a board game with my wife, it doesn't matter if it's with each other, uh, our kids, our friends, some of you are friends, you know what I'm about to say. It doesn't matter. It seems like every single time we play a board game, we get into a fight. We get into some kind of argument. And here's the deal. The reason why that happens is because someone inevitably gets too serious. That someone is me. Uh, Someone pulls out the rule book. That someone is also me. Uh, Someone accuses the other person of cheating. Yes, guilty, it's also me. Now you get it, right? I'm the problem, it's not her, it's me. I'm too competitive, I just wanna win. And so we don't play many board games together. Now, I'm guessing you don't have my problem because you're a better person than me, uh, but I am also guessing that you at least can identify with this, this feeling that I'm describing, this, this desire to win. I think there's something deeply human about wanting to win, about wanting to be a winner, about wanting to be on the winning side. I came across a quote uh, from George Patton, General George Patton. He was speaking to troops Uh, U.S. troops uh, back in the 40s before the Allied invasion in France. uh, And to get them fired up, this this is part of what he said in this speech. He said, all real Americans love the sting and clash of battle. When you were kids, you all admired the champion marble shooter, the fastest runner, the big league ball players, and the toughest boxers. He said, Americans love a winner and will not tolerate a loser. Americans play to win all the time. So go out and win, right? Go out and win. We love a winner, won't tolerate a loser. Maybe like my family, you've enjoyed watching a bunch of sports that you didn't know you cared about uh, this week, also called the Olympics. Um, And uh, I really have been enjoying them. Uh, But earlier this week, there was an interview that NBC aired, at least part of a longer interview Uh, maybe you caught it, with Simone Biles. And uh, this particular part of this interview that I saw, uh, she was discussing what it was like kind of in the aftermath of having to pull out of the 2021 Olympics in Tokyo. I'd kind of forgotten some of these details. I'd kind of forgotten uh, all that had happened. And, And she kind of goes on to describe things that people said about her, not just as an athlete, but as a person And as I was listening to her, I was just so sad for her because some of the things were 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 pretty bad. Uh, She she at once or at one point kind of referred to what was said here. This is from the Washington Times. Simone Biles is no hero; she's a quitter. Now, when this was written, she was already the most decorated gymnast in American history. But to some, she was just a quitter. No, hero, she's just a quitter. She said other people called her a loser, said that she was un-American. Why? Just because she pulled out of an athletic competition. Now, it's been kind of interesting to see the headlines and the stories this week, right? It's a much different tune. The tune has changed because she's back on top of the podium. It kind of proves the point. We we love a winner. We're not going to tolerate a loser. I saw a different headline this week, unrelated to Simone, unrelated to the Olympics or sports. It just asked the question, it said, what religion is winning? Which religion is winning? See, I I don't know if that strikes you as odd, it struck me as odd, but here's the thing. It doesn't matter if it's board games or sports or politics or war or religion or arguments. We, We wanna win. We wanna be on the winning side. We don't have tolerance for losing. 2,000 years ago, the Jews of Jesus' day had much of the same problem. They wanted to win too, but their victory, the victory they wanted, it was a political victory. They wanted a hero, but they wanted that hero to come into town and and overthrow the Romans and, and establish Israel once again. And of course, Jesus was supposed to be that hero. He was supposed to be that king, this empire conquering king. But Jesus wasn't 
the king that they expected. And because Jesus wasn't the king they expected, Jesus became the king that they rejected when the crowds gathered. And in Luke 23, we say, see that they yelled, crucify him, crucify him. Now, if the Washington Times were around back then, you can just imagine the headline, right? Jesus is no hero, just another loser. Jesus is no winner, he's just another, Jesus is no king, just a loser. Which is exactly how they treated him. Pick up in verse 26. As soldiers led Jesus away, they seized Simon from Cyrene, who was on his way in from the country. They put the cross on him and made him carry it behind Jesus. Now, we know from the Gospels that before Jesus was, was crucified, he was scourged. And what that meant is that he was whipped repeatedly. And here's the thing about that whip. The end of that whip had pieces of bone and metal and stone fragments so that, that as Jesus is being whipped over and over and over and over again, those fragments are just ripping through his flesh. And so we miss that detail here, but, but you get the idea that Jesus is, is too bloody. He's too weak. He's too exhausted. Can't even carry his own cross. And so they get it. They put it on a guy that was coming into town and say, you do it. Story continues, picking up in verse 32. Two other men, both criminals, were also let out with Jesus to be executed. When they came to the place called the Skull, they crucified him there, along with the criminals, one on his right and the other on his left. Luke kind of says it matter-of-factly. He just says they crucified Jesus. And so he spares the details, so I will too. But I should at least say that that crucifixion was a horrific way to die. It was designed by the Romans to be their most torturous form of execution. It was for the worst of criminals. It was an execution for losers. It was humiliating, it was shameful, excruciatingly painful. Crucifixions were often done alongside the busiest roads so that the most amount of people could, could see and witness and be shocked by the terror of what was happening on the cross. And as, as, as that's all happening, as the nails are going into his feet and as the nails are going into his wrists and as he's hoisted up onto the cross, how does Jesus, what does Jesus do? What does Jesus say? Well, Luke tells us, he says this. Father, forgive them. Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. See, winners make other people pay the price. But Jesus doesn't cry out for vengeance. Jesus doesn't threaten his executioners. He doesn't strike them down. No, he looks at them with love and compassion. And he prays for them. I mean, think about that for a second. I mean, it's almost unbelievable to, to, to us that, that this is what Jesus does in this moment, that, that he looks at them with love and compassion and prays for them. Think about that. Now think about them, the ones driving the nails through his feet, the ones driving the nails through his wrists, the ones hoisting him up on the cross. Jesus knows their stories. And he says, Father, forgive them. He, he sees their sin. He's grieved by their sin. And he says, Father, forgive them. He sees the trap that their lives have fallen into because they've they settled for horizontal living when they could live vertically in relationship with him. And he says, Father, forgive them. See, in this moment of unbelievable suffering, unbelievable pain, Jesus extends love, not anger. Compassion, not judgment. Prayer, not protest over their lives. Father, forgive them. Is that, here's a question. Is that how you think about Jesus? Is that the picture that you have of Jesus? Is that how you see Jesus? Maybe more importantly, do you realize that's how Jesus sees you? And what I mean by that, Audrey mentioned stories earlier we all have stories. Jesus knows your story. He knows my story. He knows our stories. And he says, forgive them. He sees our sin. 
He's grieved by our sin. He sees the trap that our lives have fallen into when we live for the horizontal and not the vertical. And yet he looks at us with love and compassion and he's offering forgiveness. And by the way, that forgiveness isn't somewhere down the road after we get it all figured out, after we get all the questions answered, that after we get over the insecurities and the doubts and we clean our lives up. No, it's, it's right now. Jesus is offering forgiveness right now. Is that what you came this morning wanting? Is that what you came this morning looking for? Because it's what Jesus wants to offer you. It's what he wants for you. We need to continue. Picking up in verse 35, Luke says, the people stood watching and the rulers even sneered at him. They said, he saved others, let him save himself if he's God's Messiah, the chosen one. The soldiers also came up and mocked him. They offered him wine vinegar and said, if you're the king of the Jews, save yourself. There was a written notice above Jesus which read, this is the king of the Jews. One of the criminals who hung there hurled insults at him. Aren't you the Messiah? Save yourself, save us. See, as the horror unfolds of what's happening to Jesus, Luke tells us that people are watching. People have gathered, crowds are around, people are watching. The religious rulers are sneering at him. The Roman soldiers are mocking him. One of the criminals being executed next to him hurls insults at him, all to the one who banished sickness and and calmed storms and brought the dead back to life with the power of his word, but he can't even save himself. He must have thought, man, this guy's a joke. This is no king, this is no winner. This is no victory, it's just another loser. Not everyone though, not everyone, verse 40. But the other criminal rebuked the criminal hurling insults. Don't you fear God, he said, since you are under the same sentence? We are punished justly for we are getting what our deeds deserved. But this man has done nothing wrong. Then he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus answered him, truly I tell you, today you will be with me in paradise. See, that man saw Jesus for who he really was. And Jesus, get this, Jesus sees him, not as a dying criminal, but he sees him in that moment as he was created to be, in a right, trusting relationship with God. And I don't know about you, but this is one of the most profound encounters, I think, in in all of the gospels that Jesus has with, with another person, at least for me, because what it teaches me and what it teaches us is that there's nothing we can do to save ourselves. There's nothing you can do to save yourself. There's nothing I can do to save myself. I think about that criminal for a second. He's hanging on the cross. Time's running out. He, he doesn't have time. He, I mean, he's going to die. He can't turn his life around. He can't fix himself. He can't make all the problems go away. He can't perform his way into a relationship with Jesus. The literal only thing he can do is look to Jesus and say, Jesus, remember me. Jesus, forgive me. Jesus, have mercy on me. And what does Jesus do? He says, yeah, I will. I forgive you. I'll have mercy on me. You're gonna be with me not just today, but for all days. See, I don't know about you, but this is like cold water to a thirsty soul for me. This is like cold water. This part of this story is like cold water to a thirsty soul for me because if I could just be honest with you for a second, I'm a recovering performer. And what I mean by that is is I love to win. And I've struggled for a long time thinking that, that I have to be more. I have to do more. It's always more, right? It's not just be, it's not just do. It's always more. I've gotta do more. I've gotta be more. It's always more if I want to be impressive. I've got to do more and be more if, if, if people are going to like me. Or, or, or it's not even just people. It's, it's God. If God's going to like me, I've got to do more. I've got to be more. But when I live like that, you know what that does for me? I've had to realize this. But what it does is all it does is it drives me further into anxiety and shame. Why? Because I fail a lot. But when you're the kind of person that thinks you're only as good as your performance for other people and for God, you know what happens when you fail? It crushes you. It crushes you. Maybe some of you this morning know the feeling that I'm talking about because that's exactly you. 
I turn 40 next year, which might be as shocking to you as it is to me, and uh, people have already started queuing up the midlife crisis jokes uh, for me, and uh, I don't know, maybe it'll come. Maybe someday I will have the proverbial midlife crisis. I haven't felt that yet, hopefully I don't, but, but if I could be honest, what I felt more of lately over the last several months if I've been, as I've been reflecting over my life is, is I've, I've felt not crisis, but clarity. And what I mean, maybe that's cliche, but at least it's true, is that, that I, I am more and more aware that Jesus sees me, that Jesus knows me, that Jesus sees and knows the, the insecurities and doubts and struggles and, and attempts to perform and, and, and my failure. He sees all of that about me, and he still loves me. He still loves me. And that's good news, isn't it? It's good news that we don't have to earn Jesus' love. We don't have to try harder. I don't have to be more. I don't have to do more. I just get to be chosen by God. I get to be prized by God. I get to be delighted in by God, and I can rest secure in that, not my performance, on the basis of what Jesus has done for me on the cross. See, I don't have to perform. I've been learning. I don't have to perform. I just get to be who I am and trust that the Spirit of God is at work in my life, changing and transforming me more and more into the man that Jesus is calling me to be as I follow him. And of course, the same is true for you. And I'm saying all of this because I want you to hear this. You don't have to be a winner for Jesus. You don't have to be Someone needs to hear that. You don't have to be a winner in order for Jesus to love you. You don't have to be impressive. You don't have to do more. You don't have to be more. You just have to look to Jesus and say, Jesus, have mercy on me. You just have to look to Jesus and say, Jesus, forgive me. Jesus, remember me. And guess what? He does. He will. He always will. Always and some of us have a hard time believing that, but it's true. He will always forgive, show mercy, love, compassion. See, I hope that encourages you this morning. I hope it brings a level of comfort. It certainly does for me. We need to keep going, though. So pick up in verse 44. It was about noon, and darkness came over the whole land until three in the afternoon, for the sun had stopped shining. And the curtain of the temple was torn in two. Jesus called out with a loud voice, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. And when he said this, he breathed his last. At last, Jesus loses. It's just another loser. At least that's what the crowds must have thought. That's what the religious leaders and rulers must have thought. The Roman soldiers, the criminal that was being executed alongside him, hurling insults, they all must have thought, this is just another loser. Jesus finally lost. But there's a plot twist, right? Because we know the rest of the story. We know that, that losing was the path to winning all along. Jesus knew he had to lose. Jesus knew he couldn't save himself. Hundreds of years before Jesus was crucified, we read this ancient prophecy in the book of Isaiah about Jesus. It says this, but he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was on him. And by his wounds, we are healed. See, Jesus wins by losing himself. He saves others by not saving himself. Mark 10, verse 45, says it like this. For even the Son of Man, Son of Man is just a title that Jesus often used for himself. For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Jesus didn't come to, to be served. He came to serve. How? By giving his life as a ransom for many on the cross. See, Jews, they wanted a winner. But they had the wrong definition of winning. Because Jesus doesn't win through force. He doesn't win through violence. He doesn't win through self-exaltation. That was for every other king in every other kingdom. No, King Jesus wins through showing humility and self-denial and sacrificial love. The problem is people couldn't see it. It, did, it just didn't make sense. Because if you can't see Jesus for who he really is, 
the cross is just gonna look like a loss. This is how Paul says it in 1 Corinthians chapter one. He says, for the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing. But to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. The message of the cross, if you don't have eyes to see Jesus for who he is, the message of the cross is foolishness. But if you can see him, then you know it's the power of God at work saving sinners. Sinners like me and you. It's a picture of of ancient graffiti uh, found back in Rome in the Uh, mid-1800s. Most say that, uh, not the picture, but the graffiti itself was from kind of the late first through third, not third, third uh, century. Um, So relatively uh, speaking, not long after Jesus had died. Now, it's kind of hard to know what you're looking at here. So here's an enhanced photo to kind of give you a better picture when it's enhanced, you see that over here on the left is, is a guy, and kind of over on the right is another guy, and it looks like he's on a cross, but he's got the head of a donkey, and, and there's some kind of inscription here, and the thing about the inscription, when you translate it, it says, Alexa Menos worships his God. And so when you understand the transcription, which you, which, which, the inscription, rather, what you realize is that this is a man worshiping Jesus. Many say that this is the earliest surviving image that we have of Jesus' crucifixion. It's interesting because it's also clearly mockery. And clearly mocking a guy worshiping Jesus. Why? Because the idea of worshiping a God who would die on a cross was asinine. Hence, Jesus with the head of a donkey. See, it's always been true. It's always been true that if you can't see Jesus for who he really is, The cross is gonna seem ridiculous. The cross is gonna seem like foolishness. The cross is just gonna seem like a loss. But if you can see it, if you can see the message of the cross for what it is, the power of God at work, saving sinners like me and you, then then what's also true is that we should expect to be ridiculed. We should expect to be mocked. We should expect to be made fun of. Or to say it another way, it's gonna take courage to follow someone that many people in our culture 2,000 years later, think is just another loser. It's gonna take courage. I use that word courage intentionally. At the end of this passage in Luke, we, we meet another man. His, his name is Joseph, and he's from a town of Arimathea. And, and Joseph, what we're told about uh, throughout the go- or in all the Gospels, is that Joseph was a follower of Jesus. He was a disciple of Jesus. But the thing about Joseph is that he was kind of a follower in disguise, So John 19, it says it like this. It says, Joseph was a disciple of Jesus. He's a follower of Jesus, but secretly, why? Well, because he feared the Jewish leaders. So so we get this snapshot of Joseph. Joseph is a follower of Jesus, but, but he follows Jesus at a distance. He's kind of following Jesus in disguise. He's following Jesus in secret. He doesn't want other people to know. Why? Because he's afraid. It says he's afraid of the Jewish leaders. In other words, he was afraid of what it might cost him if people knew that he was a follower of Jesus. But here's the thing, something changed. Something changed in Joseph's life. And that thing that changed in Joseph's life was watching his king crucified on a cross. It changed everything. Mark tells us that after Jesus was crucified, Joseph, here's that word, took courage and went to Pilate and asked for the body of Jesus. Why do you think it took courage to go to Pilate? Because if you associate yourself with with the guy that Rome just executed, who's to say that they won't do it to you too, right? But Joseph's not afraid anymore. Something has changed. Joseph is not afraid anymore. What Joseph is saying here, he's saying, look, if Jesus is willing to put his life on the line for me, then I'm willing to put my life on the line for him. I choose Jesus. I associate with Jesus. See, it took courage for Joseph to say, I want Jesus. Count me in with him. I want Jesus. Now, the question for us this morning is will we have that kind of courage? Will we have the kind of courage that that says, I want Jesus? 
even when it doesn't make sense to a watching world. I want Jesus, even if it's going to cost me something, because it's going to take courage to follow someone that many people think is just another loser. It's gonna take courage to forgive our enemies. It's gonna take courage to choose humility over pride. It's gonna take courage to consider others ahead of ourselves. It's gonna take courage to pursue self-denial over self-fulfillment. It's gonna take courage to love and sacrifice, not when it's easy, but when it's hard, especially when it's hard. It's not gonna make sense. It's not gonna make sense. But you see, remember, all of this is exactly what Jesus has done for all of us that day on the cross. He forgave his enemies. He chose humility over pride. He considered others ahead of himself. He pursued self-denial over self-fulfillment. He loved and sacrificed by allowing himself to be killed on a cross. And what that means is Jesus Jesus won through losing. And what that means is that we will too if we have the courage to follow him. Jesus won through losing, and that means we will too if we have the courage to follow him. See, the cross, it might look like a loss. It might very well look like a loss to many people in your life. But for those of us with eyes to see it, it's the power of God at work saving sinners like you and me. And that's the ultimate victory. Let's pray. Jesus, you know our stories. You know our sin. You you know the ways that our lives have fallen into a trap because we're living horizontally and not vertically. And, and, And yet it doesn't keep you away from us. You're inviting us to come and and, and you're delighting to show us forgiveness and mercy and love and compassion. Oh God, how can it be that that's true? We don't deserve that and yet that's exactly what you give to us. You won on our behalf by losing yourself on the cross. Jesus, help us to want that more and more in our lives. Help us to want that power more and more in our lives. Help us to want you more and more in our lives. Help our lives as we go out to glorify and praise you. It's in your name we pray. Amen.